Hi, and welcome back to the discussion on Hodgkin lymphoma again. Priorly, we have uh, had a session where we have talked about nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. And in this discussion, we shall be focusing on the other counterpart, that is the classic Hodgkin lymphoma, which again is different, uh, is again differentiated into multiple subtypes, like you know. So this particular discussion is going to be a very long one, actually, because there are quite a few subtypes and uh, two of the subtypes at least have quite a few differential diagnoses. So you might want to revisit this particular discussion and kind of split it up into two halves, because I think it might go into a, uh, into a period of around two hours. I shall be covering the entire Hodgkin lymphoma in this single discussion. Uh, stressing mainly on the differential diagnostic aspects from the pathological point of view. We won't be spending much time on the clinical presentation. I shall be just touching in brief about uh, the salient clinical presentations depending upon the histotypes, uh, because a little bit of that understanding is important if you are going to be analyzing a slide. So the boring clinical bits first. Classic Hodgkin lymphoma, as we know, segregates into two age groups, right? One is in the young age group between the 25 to 35 year old, and the second peak starts in the elderly at around 60 years. Most of these cases will have the lymph nodes, which is confined to the supradiaphragmatic aspect. So you can have them in the cervical or in the supraclavicular region. Mediastinum is again another important site. The mediastinal one, the, the mediastinal variant of Hodgkin lymphoma would be most likely nodular sclerosis subtype. Uh, that doesn't mean that stage three disease does not happen. It happens, especially with the mixed cellularity types and the lymphocyte depleted categories. So stage three means you would have lymph node involvement on both sides of the diaphragm, right? And stage four, again, is pretty common with the lymphocyte depleted site and also in some cases in the mixed cellularity instances. So in the case of stage four disease, you have dissemination of the disease to organs like lung, bone liver, uh, bone liver and the bone marrow. Um, so, in short, if you are seeing a Hodgkin lymphoma with pretty much disseminated kind of presentation or with presentation on both sides of the diaphragm, you'd probably think of something on the lines of mixed cellularity or the lymphocyte depleted categories. Now, Epstein-Barr virus infection is an important predisposing factor for classic Hodgkin lymphoma. But again, depending upon the subtype, we see a variable incidence of association with EBV. Thus, for example, EBV association is mostly seen in the cases of mixed cellularity or in the lymphocyte depleted subtype while nodular sclerosis and the lymphocyte-rich category has a moderate degree of association. And the kind of infectivity which is seen within the Hodgkin-Ritz Sternberg cells with the EBV virus belongs to a certain latency program known as the type 2 kind of latency, wherein we see expression of Epstein-Barr virus encoded RNA, Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen 1, but not 2, Epstein-Barr virus uh, latent membrane protein 1 and latent membrane protein 2A. So WHO gives us the essential and the desirable diagnostic criteria for classing Hodgkin lymphoma. So the essential criteria would be either a primary nodal involvement or a mediastinal presentation. Definitively, you need a hodgkin reed sternberg cell morphologically as well as immunophenotypically. Should be, uh, it should be satisfying the, the definition of a hodgkin reed sternberg cell. And also associated with it, you will find a variable proportion that is a polymorphous background of multiple different kinds of inflammatory cells, including the small lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils, histiocytes, and neutrophils. Now, this particular polymorphic distribution may not be seen in all the subtypes. This is maximally seen in the case of the mixed cellularity subtype as the name suggests, a significant proportion of eosinophils will also be associated with the nodular sclerosis category of Hodgkin lymphoma. As far as the immunophenotype is concerned, you should have a characteristic membranous and Golgi zone expression of CD30. We shall be seeing a few slides of what that particular kind of expressivity means. PAX5 expression. Now, PAX5 is basically a B cell associated nuclear transcription factor. The hodgkin reed sternberg cells are characteristically defined by weak to moderate degree of staining. So you need to compare the PAX5 expressivity with the background normal small B lymphocytes. CD20, as we have been taught, is negative in the case of the classic hodgkin reed sternberg cell. However, from the postgraduate level point of view, it's not always negative. Sometimes you can have a weak expressivity. And once in a while, you can have a heterogeneous expression wherein a few cells can show you a strong degree of expression. The desirable criteria would be the famous CD15 antigen, which would be positive in, again, the same pattern as that of the CD30. 
the cells are usually CD45, that is the leukocyte common antigen negative, and are associated with decreased expression of, again, the nuclear transcription factors for B cell, that is the OC2 and BOB1. Epstein-Barr virus will be associated with in around 40% of these cases of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Try to do a histological subtyping between the nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, lymphocyte reach, and the lymphocyte depleted possible, if it is possible. Most of the times, it won't be possible because this is the era of true cut biopsy, and oftentimes, a true cut will not give you an accurate representation of the full picture. And of course, you should be excluding the other mimics of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. We shall be stressing on that on these mimics of classic Hodgkin lymphoma as you move along and see a few of these cases. As I've already said, you got these four important subtypes. So over here on the left, you have the classic Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell, which is characterized by the binucleate Auzai appearance with a very prominent cherry red eosinophilic nucleolus and with a halo around it. <clears throat> of course, next to it, you see a Hodgkin cell, which is a mononuclear variant of the classic Reed Sternberg cell. Oftentimes, you will not be able to see a classical Reed Sternberg cell, and you will find the presence of Hodgkin cell seems to be the most important finding in your case. Of course, you'll need to uh, you'll need to search for the Reed Sternberg cell, but sometimes you'll be basically establishing a diagnosis of classic Hodgkin lymphoma simply on the presence of the Hodgkin cells and the characteristic immunophenotype which is displayed by it. So, let's divide these lymph nodes over here into the supradiaphragmatic and the infradiaphragmatic nodes. So the type of the staging system which is utilized for the Hodgkin lymphoma is basically a variation on the original Ann Arbor classification. So it's called the Cotswolds modification. The stage one would be involvement of a single lymph nodal region or, or a single lymphoid organ, like say, for example, the spleen or the thymus. If there is an external extension from in uh, in the stage one category, this would this would fall into the stage one e category. Stage two would be involvement of more than equal to two nodal groups. Again, on the on the same side of the diaphragm, it should not spread across the diaphragm onto the other uh, onto the onto the other, uh, onto the other side. The stage two e would be a localized again extranodal extension from beyond the nodes. Stage three would be involvement of the nodal groups on both the sides of the diaphragm. This again is subdivided into categories 3S, where the spleen is involved, 3E, where there is an extension to an extranodal site, and stage 3SE, where you have involvement of both the spleen as well as the extranodal site. Stage four, of course, represents the uh, kind of disseminated infection, uh, I mean, disseminated involvement of organs like bone marrow, lung, etc., liver with or without nodal involvement. Now, the presence of B symptoms is again another important finding in a case of Hodgkin lymphoma because in any category, presence of B symptom includes uh, indicates a higher, higher degree of tumoral bulk. And that is represented clinically by the manifestations of fever, night sweats, and a weight loss of more than 10% body weight over six months period. And the presence of bulky nodal disease is also clinically important because it would be manifested in the form of a nodal mass of more than one third of the diameter of the thorax or a, or a primary size of more than 10 centimeter. The importance of the staging is that most of the cases of your nodular sclerosis or the lymphocyte rich type would belong to the stage one and stage two categories, while Quite a good number of the cases of the mixed cellularity subtype or the lymphocyte depleted subtype would belong to the stage three or the stage four category. Now, a little bit about the clinical presentation. I'll finish this off in just a few words. Uh, talking about the classical Hodgkin lymphoma, you have got the nodular sclerosis and the lymphocyte rich type, which is pretty much a disease of the developed nations. And uh, especially most of the cases of Hodgkin lymphoma in developed nations would account uh, would be accounted for by the nodular sclerosis subtype, around 70% of the cases. Lymphocyte reach is a comparatively rare presentation of classical Hodgkin lymphoma accounting for less than 5%. Association with EBV is not really very strong in case of both the nodular sclerosis as well as the lymphocyte reach subtype. I mean, subtype, uh, it's a kind of an intermediate association at most. On the other hand, in the, in the developing nations, like ours, mixed cellularity and to some extent the lymphocyte depleted subtype belong uh, are the important categories of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, and they have a rather strong association with with Epstein-Barr virus. 
both mixed cellularity and the lymphocyte subtype are associated with pretty disseminated disease, often stage three and stage four. And subdiaphragmatic involvement with involvement of abdominal loads is a pretty common presentation of mixed cellularity. Oftentimes, a bone marrow might not be done in Hodgkin lymphoma, but if you have given a primary histological diagnosis of mixed cellularity, a bone marrow might be requested just to check for the degree of involvement, whether it's gone to a stage four disease or not. So these are the four categories of Hodgkin lymphoma that we shall be talking about. Nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, lymphocyte-rich, and lymphocyte-depleted variants of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, uh, let's finish this uh, thing in a single snapshot, which are the entities that we shall be focusing on mostly. So if we talk of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, we have got the nodular sclerosis category. Again, the nodular sclerosis category falls in two categories. On the left, you see the characteristic nodular sclerosis subtype, wherein you have these birefringent bands of collagen, which are kind of dissecting through the lymph nodal parenchyma and differentiating it into large nodules, right? And this is the kind of no, uh, this is the kind of histotype of of uh, the uh, of the classical Hodgkin lymphoma that you will not be making a mistake of. However, there's this particular variant of nodular sclerosis known as a syncytial variant which is mostly associated with the cellular categories, where, uh, uh, wherein the lymph node is basically, uh, it is flooded with sheets of Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, pretty pleomorphic looking, bizarre looking cells even. And as a result, the range of differential diagnosis for the syncytial variant is pretty wide. The mixed cellularity category of classic Hodgkin lymphoma is relatively easy to diagnose. And this is probably the one which will be often given to you in your slide seminars and in your exams as potters. Uh, doesn't really have too much of differential diagnosis, maybe a T cell histiocyte rich large B cell lymphoma. The lymphocyte depleted category of classic Hodgkin lymphoma is again a rare diagnosis, accounting for less than 1% of the cases. Uh, the lymph node will be basically flooded with sheets of these atypical, uh, with these atypical Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, or sometimes it might show extensive fibrosis without much of small lymphoid uh, uh, background. And lastly, another important category is the lymphocyte-rich category of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, again, this has got two kinds of presentations. One is nodular, uh, one is the nodular architecture, like you see over here, and that is the commonest kind of presentation of lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma. The other one would be a diffuse variant of the same, relatively uncommon one. So, what are the important differential diagnoses that we'll be seeing through cases in this particular discussion? Mixed cellularity, we shall be simply seeing a single case, uh, one or two cases of this. We shall, uh, we shall not be talking much about the differential diagnosis of mixed cellularity because as you go along and you, as we discuss the case, you'll see that it is a relatively easy diagnosis to make among the Hodgkin lymphoma spectrum. The lymphocyte depleted category is again, often time associated with the presence of sheets of highly atypical Reed Sternberg cells. So it would actually have a wide range of differential diagnosis. The most important being nodular sclerosis, Hodgkin lymphoma of the syncytial variant, like we have said priorly, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, both of the ALK positive and negative categories, as well as highly undifferentiated tumors like metastatic carcinoma or melanoma. The syncytial variant of nodular sclerosis, Hodgkin lymphoma, we shall be spending quite a lot of time on because this is the one variant of classic Hodgkin lymphoma that causes a lot of differential diagnostic issue. So we shall be talking about this important differential diagnosis like EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and especially within the mediastinum, two important categories of tumors which can often act as very close histological mimics. The first one being primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma, and the second being mediastinal gray zone lymphoma. Coming to the lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma of a nodular pattern, we have already talked about the differential diagnosis of this particular entity in our prior discussion on nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. And yes, the most important DD for a lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular pattern is a nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. We shall be seeing one or two cases of the same. So whatever it is, the common thread that binds most of these variants together is the presence of the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell. But again, therein lies the problem. You have to keep in mind that the classical Reed Sternberg cell, which you have been taught in your undergraduate days, is seen in quite a low proportion of cases. In many of the cases, you will find the lymph node predominantly showing the mononuclear variant of the same cell, that is the Hodgkin cell. Sometimes you might get this uh, the Hodgkin-Reed Sternberg cells showing apoptotic changes, giving rise to a mummified HRS cell. 
Sometimes it might look like a floret, like a floral cell. Multinucleate Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cells is again a very common presentation of a Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell. Keep in mind that a Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell is actually defined by the prominence of the large cherry red eosinophilic nucleolus and not the binucleation. You could have a mononuclear to multinuclear variant of Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell. It is the nucleolar feature which actually governs your morphological differential diagnosis. And in the case of the nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, you would have these Hodgkin Sternberg cells lying within a lacuna, within a clear space. Now, this is a formal infixation artifact, which, which might not be seen with B5, like mercury-based fixatives. So what about the immunohistochemical profile of this particular cell? Again, when you talk about the IHC profile of a Hodgkin Sternberg cell, you will have to segregate the entire category of classic Hodgkin lymphoma into two important subcategories. The first one would include nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, and the lymphocyte depleted subtypes, which would show more or less a similar immunophenotype. Lymphocyte rich subtype of classic Hodgkin lymphoma has quite a different picture from the characteristic uh, from the characteristic classic presentation of a Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell. But let's talk about this classic appearance of the, the, the classic uh, ISC appearance of the Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell. As we know, it's positive for CD30 as well as CD15. CD20, that is a B cell marker, is often described as negative, but it can be weak or show a heterogeneous pattern of expression. The other B cell markers like CD19 and CD79A, however, are usually absent. PAX5, which is again, uh, it is a nuclear B cell transcription factor, is weakly positive. It will be weakly positive when you compare it with the background B lymphocytes. Like you see in this particular picture, you have got this Hodgkin cell, which shows a faint nuclear positivity when you compare it with the background small B cells. The other nuclear transcription factors for B cell lineage differentiation, that is OC2 and BOB1, will be negative to weakly positive at most. CD45 will be negative and the post germinal center marker that is MUM1, IRF4 will be characteristically positive in these cases. Before we talk about the immunophenotype of the Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell in the lymphocyte rich category, let's talk about its closest differential diagnostic mimic that is the nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma associated LP cells because that is the one that you will have a differential diagnostic issue with when it comes to the Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell of the lymphocyte rich category. Now we have priorly discussed this entity of NLPHL in extensive detail in our prior video, the link for which is given below in the description box. Uh, these atypical large cells, as we know, they're called popcorn cells with a lobated nuclear configuration with vesicular nucleus with appreciable but not very gigantic nucleolus like you see in the case of the Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cell. These are characteristically immunophenotypically normal B cell, meaning that they will express positivity for CD20 along with at least one of the B cell transcription factors like BOB1, OC2, P1. So CD79A, CD19, CD20, these will be most of the times expressed in these LP cells and so will the nuclear transcription factors. BCL6 will be positive in the vast majority. BCL6 is usually negative in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma types. And uh, unlike the classic Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cells, the LP cells are usually negative for CD30. You might get occasional positivity. However, CD15 is very, very rarely expressed in the case of LP cell. EBV, unlike classic Hodgkin lymphoma, is rarely positive in the case of the LP cell category. And these are some new markers which have now come into the fray. To, to, to differentiate the NLPHL from the classic Hodgkin lymphoma associated HRS cells. So STAT6 is a marker which is present in the Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cells. Now this is the same STAT6 that we talk about in the setting of the solitary fibrous tumor. And uh, the MEF2B, now that's, not, uh, that's probably not a marker that's in widespread use, but still MEF2B is a marker which is expressed in the LP cells and not in the Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cells. So, over here, you have the LP cell. Below it is the positivity for the LP cell for CD20. As you see, the cell is showing strong membranous positivity, but the surrounding cells, which are actually T cells in this case, are negative for the for the, uh, uh, like for this marker. Below is the the is the nuclear transcription factors. Now it could be either OC2, BOB1, or PU1, which shows strong positivity in the 
Hodgkin cell and negativity in the T cells immediately around the sorry around the LP cell. This is not Hodgkin. This is a LP cell. Uh, the background. So what about the background small B cells? The background small B cells will be predominantly the B cells of the mantle zone phenotype, meaning that they will be expressing both IgM as well as IgD and the germinal center markers will be negative in those cells. And this will be associated with very expanded follicular dendritic meshwork, which can be picked up by CD21 and CD23. Immediately around the LP cells, you'll find this characteristic rosette of the T follicular helper cells, which will naturally express all the markers for this T follicular helper cell category, that is CD3, PD1, CD57, BCL6, ICOS, and CXCL13. Now, let's get back to Hodgkin, the classic Hodgkin lymphoma, and talk about the one category of Hodgkin lymphoma that we have not talked about, and that is the lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma subtype. Now, this particular Hodgkin lymphoma differs from the other three categories of Hodgkin lymphoma in that the HRS cell in this particular category can sometimes be, be negative for CD15. It can sometimes show nuclear positivity for the B cell transcription factors like OC2 and BOB1. The PAX5, which is normally only dimly expressed in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma might be brightly positive. The B cell markers like CD20 and germinal center markers like BCL6 positive uh, can be can be positive in around 30% of the cases. The, the background cells, which in the other cases is a mixture of T and B cells, sometimes can be replaced by a predominantly B cell rich background, just like you see in the case of NLPHL. And like you see in the case of NLPHL, these particular T cell rosettes around the atypical large cells of the same phenotype that is expressing CD57, PD1, et cetera, can be present in around 50% of the cases of the classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the lymphocyte-rich subtype. So lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma versus NLPHL, very, very important and close differential diagnosis. We shall be seeing a case of the same, just to bring home the point. So one slide just to revise the findings, the immunophenotypic findings that we see in the case of Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell, like we have seen, like you see over here, CD15 and CD30 would be the most important positive markers, and both will show a characteristic pattern of expression in not only the cell membrane but also in a large glob, uh, in a large blob-like fashion, just next to the nucleus, that is the paranuclear Golgi zone positivity. Tax five, like you said, will show only a uh, dim expression when you compare it to the background normal B small lymphoid cells. CD20 will be negative in most of the cases and CD3 can sometimes show a rosette around the hodgkin reed sternberg cell depending upon the subtype. The incidence of this rosette formation is maximum in the case of lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma category. And the post-germinal center marker that is the MOM1 is consistently and strongly expressed in the hodgkin reed sternberg cells. So that's an important thing that you need to keep in mind. Regarding the EBV association, quite a few cases will show positivity for the Epstein-Barr virus encoded RNA, which can be determined on in-situ hybridization. The same can also be shown by IHC for EBV-associated latent membrane protein 1. Regarding the expression of the T cell markers, now keep that in mind that a very small proportion of the cases of classic Hodgkin lymphoma can show association or can show a positivity for T cell markers, but out of that, CD4 and CD2 would be the most often expressed marker, aberrantly expressed marker, while CD3 expression would be less common. Mm -hmm. Regarding the new immunohistochemical markers which have made their way into the diagnostic surgical pathology, nuclear expression of GATA3, the same GATA3 that we talk about in the setting of urothelial cancers and CA breast, is present in around 80% of the cases. FASIN was a marker which, was, which has been talked about since long. So that is also another marker which can be present in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Strong nuclear expression of the cell cycle checkpoint protein that is PDL1 can be seen in around for, uh, in around 40% of the cases. And like I said, nuclear expression of STAT6 could help in the challenging cases where you have to differentiate the classical Hodgkin lymphoma cell from an LPHL cell. The background small lymphoid cells that you see will be usually a polyclonal mixture of B cells and T cells. However, in case of the lymphocyte rich variant, you might have a preponderance of the B cells. These B cells will be of the mantle zone type, being positive for both IgM and IgD. 
and they are the maximally prominent in the case of lymphocyte rich subtype also in the lymphocyte rich subtype in around 50% of the cases you will have these t cell rosettes composed of follicular helper cells around the hodgkin uh, around the hodgkin reed sternberg cells so this this slide this article shows you the entire immunophenotypic expression of the classical hodgkin reed sternberg cells that you see in classical hodgkin lymphoma so you have this positivity for both CD30 as well as CD15 in a membrane, as well as a paranuclear Golgi zone pattern, right? And uh, you have a DIM expression of PAX5 when you compare it with the background population of the small B cells. That is, the in situ hybridization shows positivity for Epstein Barr virus RNA. In this case, there will be, uh, in some cases, there will be a mixture of medium sized, a bit atypical looking. Uh, T cells in the background, like you see over here. So you have got this medial, uh, this this particular medium sized cell background of CD3 cells. However, keep in mind that around five percent of the Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells could also show aberrant expression of T cell antigen. Out of which CD4 and CD2 would be the most common. Before we start off with the virtual case discussion, again I acknowledge the slides that I've utilized from these two beautiful sources, one being the University of Leeds and the other from the University of Michigan virtual slide box. This first one is probably going to be an exam spotter if they keep a Hodgkin lymphoma case for you. And this is the one where the reed Sternberg cells is pretty easy to identify actually. So over here, you see the most important finding is the effacement of the architecture. You don't see the residual lymphoid follicles. You have a few lymphoid aggregates bluish lymphoid aggregates in the background, but not really a properly organized follicle. But what you see is an expansion and an effacement of the entire lymph nodal parenchyma by sheet-like architecture, which will be composed of basically your small lymphoid cells, along with cells like histiocytes, some fibroblasts, other inflammatory cells like lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils, sometimes neutrophils, and of course, your classic hodgkin reed sternberg cells. And sometimes you can also get epithelial granulomas in the mix. So let's look into this zone, which is expanded between the residual small lymphoid population. So this would be the area which I'm segregating out. As you see, even at this magnification, there are cells which raise your interest, right? There are these pretty large looking cells which do not fit into the definition of any normal, uh, any normal lymphoid cell within the lymph node. Working your way to a higher power, you see that these are the cells which you had priorly seen. Large cells, mononuclear to multinucleate to binucleate, which seem to be having a prominent nucleolus, although we are not really able to appreciate that properly at this magnification. See any other cell in the background? You see this background population of eosinophils, pretty striking. Sometimes they'll be mixed up with the population of mast cells, like in this case. But over here, you don't really see much of this atypical cell population, although there are cells that are suspicious, like say, for example, this one where my arrow points, right? The cell has a very prominent, almost cherry red like inclusion, like nucleolus, which raises the suspicion of a Hodgkin cell. This raises your interest, and you need to search basically more of the areas to pick out more numbers of Hodgkin cell and the characteristic Reed Sternberg cell. So over here more of these Hodgkin cells, very prominent eosinophilic nucleolus. And over here, you have a classical reed Sternberg cell with a binucleate appearance and a very prominent eosinophilic nucleolus mixed up with a population of atypical Hodgkin cells, right? So you see this atypical large cell population classical Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells. And as you see, quite a good number of these cells are seen, which is why I'm, uh, I say that mixed cellularity is one of the types where you have a relatively easy time diagnosing the pathology of Hodgkin lymphoma. It might not be easy in some cases, like say, for example, the syncytial variant of nodular sclerosis or the lymphocyte-rich subtype of a nodular pattern. So you have more areas where you see this classic Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells. Observe the third picture where you see a multinucleate, large multinucleate cell, but with the same kind of prominent eosinophilic nucleolus. So even these large multinucleate cells are 
variations of hodgkin reed sternberg cells they should be counted as uh, within the hodgkin reed sternberg family you could go around on a hodgkin reed sternberg cell spotting spree with these slides quite a few of them for you to identify what about the immunophenotype? The immunophenotype, of course, in this particular case is the classic one. That is, you have a positivity of the membrane as well as the Golgi zone positivity of CD15 in these cells, along with expression of CD30. The CD30 expression in this case is weaker than that of CD15. MOM1 IRF4, that is the post-germinal center marker, is also positive in this large cell population. This is another case. However, in this particular case, the atypical Hodgkin cell was a bit difficult to spot. But pay attention to the background, though. You see a good number of plasma cells. So sometimes in a case of mixed cellularity Hodgkin lymphoma, plasma cells might be the predominant uh, background inflammatory cell in a, uh, seen in association with the classical Hodgkin Nitzstermark cell. Now, this cell, which I have put in a square, is probably one that raises suspicion of being a Hodgkin cell. It's got a prominent nucleolus, right? Uh, in such cases, immunohistochemistry helps you because it actually helps to identify a larger number of Hodgkin cells compared to what you would identify with your naked eye. Like, for example, in this case, you have these relatively large cells which are negative for CD20 and also negative for CD3. When you do CD30, you see that some of these cells express the membrane as well as the paranuclear Golgi zone pattern of positivity. And likewise, in the case of CD15. So the cells express CD30 as well as CD15. The post-germinal marker, MOM1 IRF4, is also seen to be expressed in some of these atypical large cells. CD20, like I already said, was not expressed in these large cells. And also, the nuclear transcription factors like OC2, BOB1 also are not expressed. So this is a negative expression of BOB1, as you see in this case, in the classical hodgkin Sternberg cell. BCL6 is again a germinal center marker, which can be seen in the case of NLPHL, but is not seen in the case of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And this is OC2. Again, no expression of OC2. Now, uh, if we see the histology of uh, the mixed cellularity type of classical Hodgkin lymphoma, we see basically that the Hodgkin cell is kind of having a party. It's inviting lots of other inflammatory cells into the picture, right? And why does this happen? This is because the Hodgkin Sternberg cell produces a lot of chemokines like CCL5, CCL17, CCL22, which in turn brings a lot of T helper cells along with eosinophils into the picture. It also releases cytokines like interleukin-5 and interleukin-13, which are again chemotactic for cells like eosinophils. Growth factors, which are produced by the hodgkin reed sternberg cell, like the monocyte colony stimulating factor, granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor, or fibroblast growth factor 2, also bring other inflammatory cells along with fibroblasts into the mix. And how do these cells contribute to the survival of the hodgkin reed sternberg cell? Basically, the macrophage, which has been brought over, produces something known as IDO. So that's indolamine 2, 3 dioxygenase, which has got a direct suppressor effect on the NK cells as well as the cytotoxic T cells. And at the same time, there is also a downregulation of the of the activatory uh, of the activatory receptor that is NKG2D associated ligand on the surface of the HRS cell, thus resulting in loss of activation of the NK cell. At the same time, the MHC class one molecule is also is also downregulated on the surface of the HRL cell, of the of the HRS cell because of which it is uh, actually prevented from destruction by the CD8 associated cytotoxic T cells. There is a polarization of the T helper cells around the around the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells into the T regulatory subtype which is also important in the pathogenesis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And lastly, the macrophages, which is brought into the picture by the classical Hodgkin reed sternberg cell, in turn produces a lot of immunosuppressive cytokines like interleukin-10 and transforming growth factor beta. Thus, we see that the Hodgkin reed sternberg cell employs the help of cytokines and interleukins to bring a lot of different types of inflammatory pictures, inflammatory cells into the mix and utilizes these cells as its minions in order to suppress the immune response by the 
body's CD8 cytotoxic T cells. Lastly, the expression of PDL1 and PDL2 as, as checkpoint proteins by the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell also results in suppression of the CD8 associated cytotoxic T cell response. So this is in a nutshell about the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell. It is basic, uh, basically what happens is that, as we know, in the case of the germinal center, uh, the the proliferating germinal center B cells, that is your centroblasts and the immunoblasts, are uh, exposed to various kinds of antigens, wherein there happens something which is known as the affinity maturation, right, and the isotype switching. In this process, only those B cells which which uh, which basically recognize the antigens to which they have been exposed strongly and differentiate into IgG, IgE, et cetera, producing B cells will be selected to survive, while the rest of the B cells will undergo death by, by apoptosis. So if one such cell, which was destined to die by the process of apoptosis, gets, gets rescued and is kind of transformed into a malignant phenotype, the cell that you get is a Hodgkin cell. So it has a post-germinal marker positive pattern. And this Hodgkin cell sometimes will divide by the process of incomplete cytokinesis, meaning that the nucleus divides, but the cytoplasm does not, thus giving rise to a Reed-Sternberg cell. And this Hodgkin Reed-Sternberg cell, which we'll talk about as a single category, basically in, uh, it, it recruits a lot of inflammatory cells from the background, resulting in extensive remodeling of the microenvironment around it. It is dependent on these cells that it has brought into the picture. These cells will be very scarce because the power of these cells lies not in the number, but rather the kind of pro-inflammatory cytokines and other molecules that they produce. These are associated, this being a kind of a crippled, mutated germinal center B cell will not express the normal uh, B antigens, which are seen in the usual B cell category. And at the same time, they will acquire markers which are not present in B cells, like say, for example, your CD15. And they have a tendency to evade the immune system by multiple mechanisms, which we have already discussed. So we have seen a case of mixed cellularity classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Let's now move on to the next category, that is the lymphocyte-rich subtype of classic Hodgkin lymphoma of a nodular pattern. Like I said, this, this particular category is sometimes pretty tough to diagnose, and the most important differential diagnosis that you'll have for this subtype is a nodular lymphocyte-predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, an issue which we have already covered in the other discussion on NLPHL. So if you see, there is an effacement of the architecture of the lymph node by large sized follicles or rather nodules of varying sizes because they don't really look like a classic lymphoid follicle. These are more like large nodules which are spread throughout the lymph nodal parenchyma, thus resulting in an effacement of the lymph nodal architecture. So you see these large nodules which are present. And these nodules seem to have a kind of a mottled appearance, just like you saw in the case of nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, right? So you have one nodule over here and another nodule over there. And towards the periphery of these nodules, there seems to be a little bit of a mottled architecture. So if you look closely, you'll see that these nodules are predominantly composed of a population of small lymphoid cells. But along with them, you have a population of cells which are slightly larger with a bit of a prominent nucleolus, but again, these do not look like a classic Hodgkin cell, okay? But again, the presence of cells like this should make you a bit wary, and you need to basically search closely and look for either a Hodgkin Sternberg cell or a, L, uh, or a LP cell of NLPHL. Looking elsewhere in the slide, you see that there are these cells which have got very gigantic, almost cherry, red eosinophilic enlarged nucleolus, inclusion-like nucleolus. So these raise the suspicion of a classic Hodgkin lymphoma, that is the classical Hodgkin cells. Looking elsewhere in the slide, you come across more of cells of this type. Observe that in the second slide, this cell also kind of looks like a LP cell of NLPHL. So you will have that morphological differential diagnosis, of course whenever you come across such cases and you will utilize a battery of immunohistochemical tests in order to arrive at a conclusion of whether this is a Hodgkin Sternberg cell or a LP cell. Now in the third image, there is a cell which kind of looks like the Reed Sternberg cell that we have 
uh, we have come to see which exists in the case of a classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, talking about the immunophenotype, at a very scanner view, you see that on doing CD20, the population is seen to be mostly B lymphoid cells within these nodules, right? You've got a very B cell rich background. But when you look within the cell population, within this B cell rich background, you see that these cells, these large atypical cells which are present, along with those cells which look like the reed sternberg cells are negative for expression of B marker like CD20. Again, observe in this particular case, there is a halo of cells which are also negative for CD20 around the Hodgkin reed sternberg cell, meaning that on doing CD3, you are most likely going to get that characteristic color it around these atypical cells, just like you saw in the case of NLPHL, right? CD19 also being a B cell marker will show you the same kind of expressivity. There is a loss of expression of CD19 in these atypical large cells and the atypical T cell rosettes, which are present as colors around these Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells are also negative for them. CD3 has highlighted the exact same issue that I was telling you about. That is, you get these colorets of T follicular helper cells, which form a rim around the atypical Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells, right? OC2. As we have already said, OC2, BOB1, these are basically B cell associated transcription factors, which will not be present in the case of the Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells. So there is no expression of OC2, but the background B lymphoid cells are showing nuclear positivity for OC2. MOM1 IR4, IRF4 is a post-germinal center marker, which is characteristically expressed in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So we see a positivity for MOM1 in this case. CD30. CD30 and CD15 are positive markers seen in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma and are expressed in a cell membrane as well as a perinuclear Golgi zone pattern of positivity, which is seen also in this particular case. Same for CD15. An expression is seen in a membranous fashion as well as a perinuclear Golgi zone positivity. So this is what you see in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the lymphocyte rich subtype. You have a very prominent B cell rich background within the nodules. You have a large atypical Hodgkin rich Sternberg cell population, which is mostly seen often at the periphery of these nodules. And these are surrounded by a population of rosetting T cells of the helper T cell phenotype. These large atypical Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells are usually negative for CD20 in around up to 70% of cases. Also negative for other B cell markers like CD19, CD79A, do not express the B cell association yeah, associated transcription factors and are weak in expressivity of PAX5. CD15 may not be seen in a good number of cases. And however, CD30 is present in most of the cases. EBV is often positive and EMA expression is rare. MOM1, that is the post-germinal center marker, will be positive. Now, the important thing about this, this particular subtype is, like I said, CD20 can be basically expressed in around up to 30% of the cases, which raises, which makes the problem, uh, which makes the differential diagnosis from NLPHL problematic. Similarly, in some cases, OC2 and BOB1 can be expressed, which again, causes differential diagnostic issue when you have a when you have a nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma in question. And it is very important to actually segregate the two. Why? Because relapses are much more common in nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. And also, as we have already discussed in the other video, the higher the number of relapses, the more is the chance that this NLPHL might actually undergo transformation into a very high grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma say, for example, a T-cell histiocyte-rich large B-cell lymphoma or a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. This is a risk which is not seen in the case of the lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, this, this journal article shows the same thing that I talked about, the characteristic histological appearance in the case of lymphocyte-rich category, along with the presence of these atypical rich Sternberg cells. And like you see, the CD30 expression in the membranous as well as in the Golgi zone pattern and the rosetting by this PD1 positive, CD57 positive T follicular helper cells. Another case of lymphocyte rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma showing the same, showing the same histological presentation as well as the immunohistochemical presentation of CD30, CD15 positive, 
CD20 negative and PAX5 deemed Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, which are surrounded by a collar of PD1 positive CD3 T helper cells. Now let's have a case where we discuss uh, the differential diagnostic issue between nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma versus this particular category of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, that is lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular category. As you see, there is an obliteration, there is an effacement of the lymphoid architecture by large nodules of varying sizes. You don't see follicles really, rather you see large nodules which are concentrated throughout the lymph nodal parenchyma resulting in an effacement of the architecture. Now this is a pattern which might be seen in both NLPHL as well as the nodular pattern of lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, you will have to look deeper into these nodules to see what kind of atypical large cell population, if any, are seen within these areas. So you see there's a kind of a mottled, moth-eaten appearance, towards the, especially towards the periphery of these nodules. And looking into these areas, you see that there are cells which are slightly more pink and slightly larger than the background population of small lymphoid cells, right? So if you see these areas at a higher power, you see that there is basically a combination of cells which look slightly plump, histiocytoid, along with a few cells which seem to have prominent nucleolus. But like, as I said, these cells do not really have the characteristic prominence of the nucleolus as you see in the case of the hodgkin reed sternberg cell. Sometimes they can be mistaken for LP cells and vice versa. There are these cells which are larger with prominent nucleolus, as you see over here. This raises suspicion, but again, you will definitely need IHC to, to finally establish your clinical, uh, to finally establish your histological suspicion. Looking elsewhere, within the same case, you come across these cells with prominent nucleolus. As you see, there are these cells which look a little bit like popcorn cells, that is the LP cells, with a kind of a, a cleaved, cleaved nuclear con, uh, I mean contour, vesicular nucleolus, I mean nucleus with pinpoint nucleoli. Now, this particular cell does look a little bit like a Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell. So you have atypical cells of varying sizes, but quite a few which, which still makes you entertain the possibility of a nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. And that's the most important issue in the case of the lymphocyte rich category of Hodgkin lymphoma. You can never get the suspicion of NLPHL out of your head. That will basically haunt you till the end of your, uh, till you have reached the end of your IHC profile. Okay, so we start off this particular case with analysis of the CD21. As I've already discussed in my prior video, CD21, CD23, and less often CD35 are basically used as follicular dendritic cell markers. So they basically are used to highlight the nodular architecture that was appreciable even on an HNE &E view. And any amount of nodularity, as we know, is kind of characteristic of a nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, but this nodularity can also be seen in the case of nodular variant of lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So we see the nodular pattern highlighted with this particular marker. Now going to CD45, CD45 shows a strong background positivity in the lymphoid population, the small lymphoid population in the background. However, interestingly, in this particular case, CD45 also seems to be expressed on the membrane of the atypical large cell population. As you see, the intensity, that is the, that is the degree of staining of the membrane of the large cell is quite deep compared to the background small, small lymphoid cells, which shows that these large cells have got a staining of their own. Now, this is slightly unusual because we know that in the case of a classic Hodgkin lymphoma, CD45 is most often not seen. However, a few cases of lymphocyte-rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma may express CD45. On doing CD20, you see that this, these same nodules are basically picked up as B lymphoid cell rich, rich nodules. And in this particular case, you see that this atypical large cell population is also expressing CD20. Like I said, around 30% of the lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma can still show membrane positivity for B cell markers like CD20. That does not rule out your diagnosis of a classic lymphocyte-rich Hodgkin lymphoma. Further areas show CD20 positivity in more of these atypical Hodgkin cells. PAX5, 
tax five again fits into the characteristic description of what we have already talked about in the context of the Hodgkin Ritz term cells. That is, you see a dim expression within this atypical large cell population when you compare them to the background small B lymphoid cells. Right. So that's one point in favor of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. CD30 again shows you a pretty strong expressivity within this atypical large cell population and see the positivity is present in a membranous as well as in a paranuclear Golgi zone kind of a pattern. And also the same, the, uh, a similar pattern of expression is seen with CD15. So these cells, although they express B cell marker and are expressing CD45 in some of the cells, they are showing a dim positivity for PAX5 and strong positivity for CD30 and CD15. So most likely this is a case of a uh, lymphocyte rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Although I should say that this immunopanel seems to be a slightly uh, small immunopanel in that you actually need to do quite a few other markers. You need to have BCL6 along with MOM1 and also at least a couple of more B cell associated transcription factors like say OC2, BOB1 and probably CD79A as a B cell marker. And as I said in, the, in my prior video on the nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma, lymphocyte-rich variant of classical Hodgkin lymphoma is a very close DD and can often show extensive degree of immunophenotypic overlap with NLPHL. The importance in segregating the two is the prognostication. The NLPHL cases are prone to multiple recurrences and a, ch and a chance of progression that is a transformation to a much high grade non Hodgkin lymphoma, and that does not exist in the case of lymphocyte rich classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, moving on to the classical Hodgkin lymphoma, classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular sclerosis subtype. Now, this, for uh, this, this case is something which is pretty easy to diagnose. Like if it's given to you as a spotter in your exam, I'm sure that you will be able to diagnose it pretty fast. Uh, you have got an obliteration of the lymph nodal architecture, you are having this multiple thick birefringent pink collagenous bands, which, are, which seem to be dissecting the entire lymph nodal parenchyma into large nodules of varying sizes, right? And once you look into these nodules, which are present between the dissecting bands of collagen, you see that they are rich in small lymphocytes, but they also have a population of eosinophils within them and a substantial proportion of cells of atypical mononuclear large cells with very prominent nucleolus uh, that is your Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cells. Quite a few of them appear to be lying in this uh, in these white spaces. That is the lacunae. So these these lacunar cells are something which is seen in the case of the nodular sclerosis subtype of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Although remember, it's a formalin fixation artifact and may not be seen if your uh, if your uh, if your specimen has been fixed in uh, in something like a B5 fixative. Okay, so you have this characteristic lacunar cells with the very prominent eosinophilic nucleolus. And these are the diagnostic hallmark cells of the nodular sclerosis subtype of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. You also see this eosinophils as a part of the background inflammatory cell population. What about the immunophenotype? Immunophenotype will be more or less fitting along with the description of the immunophenotype that we had priorly covered when we talked about the normal IHC profile of the classical Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cells. These cells are negative for CD20. As you see, there's no surface expression of CD20 while the background lymphoid cells are showing positivity. Observe this cell. The membrane is devoid of expression of CD20. So these are CD20 negative cells in a background which is rich in small CD20 positive B cells. PAX5 again highlights the weak, faint, moderate positivity of the atypical large cell population of the HRS cells when you compare it to the strong background positivity of the small B cells in the background. CD3, again, will be neg is, is, uh, is negative in these cells, but they show uh, the presence of a substantial proportion of intermixed normal T lymphoid cells. CD15 and CD30 show you the characteristic pattern of expression in the cell membrane, as well as in the paranuclear Golgi zone in these atypical Hodgkin Ritz Sternberg cells. Now, this is the second case, which is again a usual appearance of the dissection of the lymphoid parenchyma by multiple large fibrocollagenous septae of varying sizes, resulting in these large nodules. 
right? And within these large nodules, you see that there is a mixed population of small lymphoid cells along with these lacunar cells. The lacunar variant of the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells that you see in the background observe the significant proportion of eosinophils, which is always, which is quite often a part of the mix of cells that you see along with the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. So you see this classical Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells with the characteristic owl's eye appearance and the prominent eosinophilic nucleolus. Again, CD30 shows you a characteristic membrane as well as a paranuclear Golgi zone positivity within these cells. CD15 shows you the same pattern of expression, membrane and the Golgi zone. CD20 is seen to be negative within these cells, although it is picking up a part of the background population of the small B cells. The atypical large cells per se are negative. PAX5 shows a DIM pattern of expression in the atypical Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. DIM when you compare it to the background population of small B lymphoid cells. And this is how the nodular sclerosis subtype would look. You have this pink birefringent bands of collagen with nodules of varying sizes, which are comprised of the lacunar cells, eosinophils, and a mix of B and T lymphoid cells in the background. So this, this, uh, this journal article basically shows you the same thing, the birefringent bands of collagen, the atypical, uh, the atypical Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, sometimes present as, a, as, the, uh, as the lacunar cells and showing a strong positivity for both CD30 as well as CD15. Now, this is what we see in the case of usual nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, which is probably not that tough to diagnose, but there, there is one end of the spectrum of nodular sclerosis uh, of the nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, which presents with a large cellularity, with, with a lot of cells, with a lot of which kind of cells? The atypical Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. So this is known as the cellular phase, wherein you can get even sheets of these atypical large Hodgkin, uh, Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. As you see, the pattern over here is nodular focally, but at some places it looks like there's a kind of a diffuse effacement. And if you see within these areas, you, you seem to be having sheets of cells which look quite large. Of course, you are not able to concentrate. I mean, you're not able to pick up the cytological details of these large cells, but you do have an impression as if there are going to be quite a few large cells in this area of the slide. And when you see it at a higher power, you see that yes, this, these large cells do express the very prominent eosinophilic cherry red like nucleolus, like you see in the case of the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, right? So you have this characteristic Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, some of them with the binucleate Auzai kind of an appearance in this area. And once you do an immunophenotyping, you see that the cells are negative for CD20, although some of the background B cells, the like some of the background small B cells show you positivity, show you strong CD20 positivity. CD30 again picks up positivity within some of these large cells. CD15 also shows positivity in a significant number of these large cells in a membrane and a perinuclear Golgi zone pattern. Again, in this case, you have a kind of a nodular pattern, although there are areas where the nodule seems to have uh, uh, seem to have coalesced into large sheets, basically. So in these sheet-like areas, again, you have this kind of syncytium or nests and sheets of these atypical large cells, which at a high, uh, which at this power raise the suspicion as if they could be the uh, the lacunar cells of nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, right? All of them lying in these clear spaces. And if you see them at a higher power, you will find these cells have the same gigantic prominent nucleolus like you see in the case of Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells, right? A typical large cell population with very prominent nucleolus. So these look like Hodgkin cells. And at places they are mixed up with multinucleate uh, with these multinuclear giant cells having the same kind of nuclear features as those of the atypical Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. The immunophenotype in this particular case shows a characteristic expression as, as, uh, as expected in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So the cells are positive for CD15 and CD30. They strongly express the post-germinal marker MOM1 IRF4. They are negative for CD20 as well as for B-cell transcription factors like OC2 and BOB1. So this is a syncytial variant or a cellular phase of classical of, of classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular sclerosis type. So this journal article shows the same scenario 
illustrates the same scenario wherein you have sheets of Hodgkin, atypical Hodgkin needs turn mark cells effacing the lymph node parenchyma. Observe the population of eosinophils, which seem to be a part of the picture in association, which are seen in association with this atypical Hodgkin needs turn mark cells. CD30 is strongly positive in these cells. Two other markers of significance which can be utilized to highlight these atypical Hodgkin needs turn mark cells in the sensational variant are PDL1 and P53. This has been highlighted in this particular article, so you can utilize them to your advantage. Now, talking about the differential diagnosis of nodular sclerosis, classic Hodgkin lymphoma, in the usual case of nodular sclerosis, you should not really be having too much of differential diagnosis. The problem arises once you are faced with a syncytial variant of nodular sclerosis type of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. In this case, if the site of the disease is the node, an important differential diagnosis is EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Of course, because it's a DLBCL, the phenotype of the atypical cell is pan B cell antigen positive. However, these cells can be positive for CD30. So keep that in mind. CD30, although it is utilized as a positive marker in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, it is often expressed in many of the histological mimics of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Keep that in mind. However, CD15 is usually negative in these cases. And CD45, unlike classic Hodgkin lymphoma, is usually expressed in the case of EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The, the most of the problem happens in the case of needle biopsy, because in a needle biopsy, oftentimes you don't have the adequate representation of the tumoral element, which helps you segregate the two, the two different histotypes. Anaplastic large cell lymphoma is again another important differential diagnosis when it comes to the lymph node. Even in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, you get sheets of atypical large cells, many of which might look like your Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. So uh, the most important DD of a cellular phase of nodular sclerosis subtype would again be an anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Again, like I said, CD30 is a marker which is also strongly positive in the case of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So don't depend on CD30 alone. CD15 expression, however, is rare in the case of ALCL. And of course, because it's of a mature T-cell phenotype, anaplastic large cell lymphoma will be negative for the B-cell transcription factor PAX5 and, uh, can, and will express basically T-cell markers. But in the context of ALCL, keep it in mind that many of the mature B-cell markers, like say, for example, CD3, CD5, CD7 can show variable degrees of loss. So in order to diagnose ALCL, you might have to utilize more than one mature T-cell markers. So that's important to be kept in mind. And two important differential diagnoses arise in a very important site, that is the mediastinum. So if you have a nodular sclerosis subtype of Hodgkin lymphoma in the mediastinum, and we know that mediastinum is a common site for the nodular sclerosis subtype, right? So the two important differential diagnoses for NS type of classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the syncytial variant are, firstly, the primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma and a mediastinal, graze, uh, a mediastinal graze on lymphoma, wherein there's a significant histological overlap which spans both the classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular sclerosis subtype and primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma. So this is a kind of an overlap gray zone scenario. And not only the morphology, even the immunophenotypic features can overlap. So in the case of primary mediastinal large B lymphoma, you have a pattern of sheets of atypical large lymphoid cells, many of which show clear cell chain. An important feature that you see in the case of PMBL is a compartmentalization. So even among the diffuse sheet, you have these small nests. Uh, I mean, you have these nests of atypical large cells, which seem to be compartmentalized or separated by fine strands of collagen. This is something which is, uni uh, which is unique to PMBL, but can sometimes be seen also in the gray zone category of lymphomas. And because this is of a DLBCL kind of a kind of a tumor, the, the neoplastic cells in the primary mediastinum and large B cell lymphoma will express most of the pan B cell markers along with OC2 and BOB1. And importantly, CD30 may be expressed, but the CD30 will be usually focal heterogeneous and weak in expression compared to the strong expression that you see in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. However, CD15 is usually negative. Mediastinal gray zone lymphomas, like I said, there's a lot of morphologic overlap between the syncytial variant of classic Hodgkin lymphoma and primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. And just not that, there's also immunophenotypic overlap in that 
a cell which looks like a hodgkin Nierstenberg cell in a gray zone category will express markers which are more often seen in association with high-grade B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So there is a lot of immunophenotypic issues as well as far as this particular diagnosis is concerned. Now we shall be seeing a couple of cases of each of these tumor categories in order to highlight the points. Now let's look at this particular case. There seems to be a kind of a effacement of the architecture. You don't see any lymphoid follicles in this particular uh, uh, in this in this particular slide. What you see is sheets of atypical large cells, many of which seem to be having the clear cell morphology, and quite a few might actually be mistaken for the lacunar cells that you have priorly seen in the case of the nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, right? Especially the syncytial phase. Observe that there is an intermixed population of small lymphoid cells also in the background. And if you look closely, even within this diffuse architecture, you it seems to be kind of, you know, kind of compartmentalized into small islands, which are separated by thin strands of collagen at places. So this kind of compartmentalization is something which is seen in the case of primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma. Like I said already, quite a few of these cells will have the clear cell appearance, which might be mistaken for the lacunar cells of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Observe these fine strands of collagen, which sometimes seem to compartmentalize the, uh, the the diffuse sheets resulting in a kind of a nodular, vaguely small nodular architecture. And the atypical cells, quite a few of them look like the atypical Hodgkin cells, that is the lacunar cells. And you at places you have some cells which give you a slightly binucleate reed uh, Sternberg kind of an appearance. What about the immunophenotype of these cases of primary mediastinal and large B-cell lymphoma? Like I said, these belong to the large B-cell lymphoma category. So these will be naturally strongly positive for CD20 as well as the other mature B-cell markers, including the transcription factors for B-cell lineage like your OC2, BOB1, etc. Now, as far as the BCL6 is concerned, some of these cells will show nuclear expression of BCL6. IRF4, that is a post-germinal center marker, we said that it is positive in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. However, the IRF4 is also expressed in the case of primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. And now in the lower row are a few markers, use of which is very important in order to diagnose the primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. So for example, these markers like CD30 and CD23 should be used as a part of your panel because if they are positive, they would help to substantiate your diagnosis of a primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. Observe that CD30 seems to be positive in some of these atypical large cells, a few of which look like the classic hodgkin reed sternberg cell, right? They've got the same pattern of expressivity in the membrane as well as in the Golgi zone. However, the staining is heterogeneous and weak not really as strong as you see in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. CD, CD, CD23 also seems to be positive in some of these large cells. So these immunophenotypic markers like CD30, CD23, if expressed within the context of a large cell neoplasm in the mediastinum would favor, uh, would favor a diagnosis of primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma if you have that histological suspicion in mind. PDL1 again is another marker which adds strong weightage to the, the possibility of it being a primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. So in this particular case, the, the, um, the IHC system which has been utilized is basically alkaline phosphatase and uh, the chromogen is fast red instead of damp, which is why you get the reddish coloration. So as per the WHO criteria, these are the important diagnostic criteria for primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. Essential criteria being that it has to be a large B-cell established by IHC, B-cell lymphoma in the anterior mediastinum showing a mature B-cell phenotype, and at least, like I said, partial expression of markers CD23 and CD30. And desirable diagnostic criteria would be the characteristic band-like collagenization, which kind of differentiates the entire tumor into small nests, and expression of at least one of the following markers, that is MAL, we don't really use that too much, but PDL1 is something which is utilized, as well as CD200, these two markers, can add to your diagnosis when you have a primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma as a suspicion. So the immunophenotype of the cell in primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma would be positive for LCA, along with strong expression of the B-cell antigens, as well as strong expression of the B-cell transcription factors. 
Many of the cells will be positive for CD30, but it will be heterogeneous and weak expression compared to the classic Hodgkin, Hodgkin lymphoma cells. CD15 positivity, however, is rare. And if at all present, it will be only as a small dot next to the nucleus and not the characteristic membrane and Golgi zone pattern of positivity. Many of these cases will express the post-germinal marker, that is MUM1. There will be variable expression of BCL6, but CD10, which is the other germinal center marker, will not be expressed. You will have... In many of the cases, strong positivity for CD23, CD, CD200, PDL1, etc. EBV expression, however, unlike classic Hodgkin lymphoma, is exceptional in the case of primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. So, this journal article highlights one of those cases of primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. Look at the characteristic compartmentalization of the atypical large lymphoid cell population by these bands of collagen. Many of these cells seem to resemble the characteristic lacunar cells which we have seen in the syncytial variant. CD20 is very strongly expressed. Now, this degree of strong CD20 expression would not be seen in a case of a classical nodular sclerosis type of Hodgkin lymphoma. CD30 appears to be positive, although in a kind of a heterogeneous fashion. And OC2 shows nuclear positivity within this atypical large cell population. Now, this is a gray zone lymphoma. A gray zone lymphoma in the mediastinum is one where morphologically you have the suspicion of either a primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma or a, or a classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular sclerosis subtype that is a syncytial variant. But when you do IHC, if you had thought of a Hodgkin lymphoma, you find quite a few markers which do not belong to the category of Hodgkin lymphoma. And if you if you had been thinking of a primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, you get markers like say, CD30 along with CD uh, along with CD15, which take your diagnosis away towards the diagnosis of a classical Hodgkin lymphoma. But the problem here is that you don't have a single histotype or immunophenotype to fit into a single histological category. So this kind of lymphomas uh, tend to straddle the gray zone between the syncytial variant of nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma and primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, thus resulting in a characteristic overlap of PMBL with a classic Hodgkin lymphoma. The histological appearance in this case will be a sheet-like effacement of the architecture of the parenchyma and along with cells, quite a few of which look like the lacunar cells, mononuclear Hodgkin cells, along with cells which have the very prominent gigantic nucleolus of uh, like the characteristic Hodgkin reed sternberg cells. You also have binuclear cells which fit into the definition of a reed of a characteristic Hodgkin reed sternberg cell. So like you see in this particular field, quite a few of these large cells have very prominent nucleolus as we would expect to see in the case of a Hodgkin cell, right? And over here, along with these atypical large Hodgkin cells, you also have cells which give you the impression of reed Sternberg cell. Observe the binuclear cells with very, very prominent nucleolus. So for all practical purposes, when you look at such a slide with uh, at, uh, in an uh, in a H &E section, you have the suspicion of a Hodgkin reed Sternberg cell, right? And so you proceed with the immunophenotype. Now, CD30 shows a strong positivity in the membrane as well as in the Golgi zone. So now that's one point towards the classic Hodgkin lymphoma. But then you also have to keep in possibility uh, in mind the, the, the possibility that even primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma may express CD30. However, the expression is usually not as strong in the case of primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. CD15 shows you a nice positivity both in the membrane as well as in the paranuclear Golgi zone kind of pattern. Now, this pattern of expression would be very unusual in the case of primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. So that's one point in favor of classic Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular sclerosis subtype. But now comes the problem. You do CD20 and in a case of the classical Hodgkin lymphoma, you don't expect CD20 to be positive, right? But many of these cells seem to be showing expression of CD20. To make matters worse, when you, when you do ISC for nuclear transcription factors like OC2 and BOB1, you see that there is a strong nuclear expression in the B cell associated transcription factors within the large cell population. So herein you have a case which looks like Hodgkin lymphoma, which express the Hodgkin lymphoma markers CD15 and CD30, but which at the same time also express quite at least three of the B cell associated markers like CD20, OC2 and BOB1. Now that's more in the direction of a primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, right? But what do you call it? So this one ends up with a diagnosis of a gray zone lymphoma 
but in this case the histology tends to uh, tends to side towards a nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma. So this would be a gray zone lymphoma, but with a morphological semblance of a nodular sclerosis subtype. Okay, so this is the immunophenotype of the mediastinal gray zone lymphoma of the classic Hodgkin lymphoma-like appearance. There is a uniform and strong expression of B-cell markers, which is unlike what you see in the case of a classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So this would include the normal B-cell associated membrane factors like CD20, 19, and 79A, along with nuclear transcription factors like Pax5, OC2, and Bob1. Now, the new WHO classification, there is a fifth edition, is very stringent about how you will define expressivity of B-cell in the context of a gray zone lymphoma. As per them, you will need expression in at least three B cell associated markers. So the you know the most common marker which is utilized in our routine surgical pathology practice in lymph node is CD20 and Pax5, right? So, but that CD20 and Pax5 alone will not be enough to define uh, lymphoma as a gray zone lymphoma. You will need at least one more marker of B cell to be done in order to fit it into the category of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, but belonging to the gray zone category. That could be anything. It could be CD19, CD79A, or your nuclear transcription factors like OC2 and Bob1. But you need to have an extra marker beyond CD20 and Pax5 in order to establish the B cell positivity in the case of a mediastinal gray zone lymphoma. So this is an important point that is to be kept in mind. If you have only CD20 and Pax5 at your disposal and you find that what looks like a classic Hodgkin lymphoma is still showing positivity for CD20 and Pax5, you would still favor a diagnosis of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. Keep that in mind. In order to call it gray zone, you need one additional marker of B cell origin. And this will be characteristically positive for CD30, the gray zone ones, but CD15 is expression is rare. And if it is present, it is present in only a minority, but CD15 would be very rare in the case of a gray zone lymphoma. And uh, Epstein-Barr virus associated RNA, in situ hybridization is negative, unlike classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So that's another important thing to be kept in mind. So in this particular case, you see that this is a gray zone lymphoma again, uh, which kind of gives you the compartmentalized kind of appearance that you see in the case of the primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. But some of these cells do look a bit like classic Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. And when you do uh, immunophenotyping, you see that the cells are positive for two B cell markers, right? You have a positivity for CD20 as well as strong positive expression for Pax5. But you also have strong expression of the Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell markers like CD30 and CD15. So although this particular article highlights this case as a gray zone lymphoma, as per the WHO criteria, we would need one other B cell marker, one additional B cell marker to be to be done in order to establish the B cell lineage. So you have done CD20 and Pax5, well and good. Consider adding OC2, Bob1, or probably a CD79A to your panel in order to further establish the B cell lineage of this particular gray zone lymphoma. This is another case of mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, which is again characterized by these sheets of atypical lymphoid cells, some of which look a little bit like Hodgkin reeds, uh, like, like Hodgkin reeds Sternberg cells. You do CD30 and CD15 and see that there is a strong expression for both. But again, when you do CD20 and OC2, you see there is also a strong nuclear expression. For, uh, there is a strong expression for B cell associated markers, which is unusual in the case of nodular sclerosis subtype of Hodgkin. So in this case, before calling it a mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, because you have done only two B cell markers, consider adding one more B cell marker, either an OC2, Bob1, or a CD79A, in order to further establish the B cell nature of your atypical tumor cells. Okay, so as per the new WHO classification, the mediastinal gray zone lymphomas can be characterized into those which morphologically look like classic Hodgkin lymphoma, but which, in addition to the classical Hodgkin lymphoma appearance, of CD30 positivity also show you the unusual strong positivity for B cell markers like CD20 and Pax5. But in addition, they need to be worked up for one additional B cell marker like, CD, uh, like CD19, 79A, Bob1, or OC2. On the other hand, you could have a mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, which looks like on histology like a primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, but which unusually show very strong expression and uniform expression of CD30. Now, this is something which is unusual in a case of primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma. If you go back to the prior slides, 
of PMBL, you would have seen that the expression of CD30 is weak and heterogeneous at most. So a strong and uniform CD30 expression in a tumor, which looks like a primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, or a complete loss of B-cell markers, which will be very unusual in the case of a normal mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, or strong CD15 expression would put that so-called primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma into the mediastinal gray zone lymphoma category of a primary mediastinal b like appearance. So the features that would favor the primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma would be an absence of nodularity without eosinophils, and the cells would be LCA positive along with strong positivity for the B cell associated markers. They will show CD30 weak expression at most and not express CD15. Those that favor the, the classical Hodgkin lymphoma of the nodular sclerosis subtype will be usually negative for CD45 can variably express CD20 and PAX5, but they should not express other additional uh, B-cell markers like OC2, BOB1, CD79A, etc. While those that favor the gray zone lymphoma intermediate between the PMBL, that is primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma and classic Hodgkin lymphoma, will have a histomorphological overlap between the two cases. They will have strong positivity for CD45 along with more than two B cell markers, that is CD20, CD79A, along with OC2, BOB1, they will also show variable degrees of positivity for CD30 and CD15. So as per the latest WHO classification, this is how you differentiate the classic Hodgkin lymphoma, that is the nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, the syncytial variant from a mediastinal gray zone lymphoma. You need to have uniform strong expression of CD20 and PAX5 along with one additional B cell marker to call it a mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, while your classic Hodgkin lymphoma is usually negative for OC2, BOB1, etc., and usually negative for markers like CD19 and CD79. CD30 expression is very uniform and strong in the case of Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. They're mostly heterogeneous in the case of gray zone lymphoma. CD15 is usually positive in at least some Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cells. Oftentimes, mediastinal gray zone lymphoma will be negative for CD15. And Epstein Barr virus associated, uh, I mean, markers like, say, in situ hybridization or LMP will be present in the case, if it is present, it, it will support a diagnosis of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. In the case of mediastinal gray zone lymphoma, EBV expression is usually rare, exceedingly rare. Now coming to the third differential diagnostic category for again, nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma of the syncytial variant. This is anaplastic large cell lymphoma. As you see, the lymph node architecture over here is effaced by diffuse sheets of atypical large cells, a few of which appear to be lying within lacunar spaces, right? And they give you the impression of Hodgkin cells, right? They appear to be lying in lacunae. Observe the mitotic figure over here. And of course you, could morphologically have an issue with the syncytial variant of nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma. A couple of those might even look like your characteristic reeds, uh, like your characteristic reed Sternberg cell. Observe that a couple of cells here show binucleation along with prominent nucleoli. So if you do uh, IHC, you see that the T cell marker CD3 is only expressed in a few of the background small lymphoid cells. The bulk of the atypical large cells are actually negative for CD3. Now keep this in mind in the context of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. As I have said already, many of these ALCLs will basically drop multiple mature T cell markers. What are the multiple mature uh, uh, T cell markers that we utilize in diagnostic surgical pathology? CD2, CD3, CD5, and CD7. So if you utilize three or four of these markers, you will see that a tumor, which is of the mature T cell lineage, ideally should express all these markers, right? But in these cases of anaplastic large cell lymphoma and, and even in PTCL, they will drop random antigens. So sometimes you will have no expression for CD3, but within the same tumor, you will have strong expression of CD4. Okay, so this kind of heterogeneity as far as the expression of mature T cell antigen is concerned is a diagnostic hall, is an important hallmark of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Observe the inset. You see that one of these atypical large cells, which has been picked up with CD4, looks a bit like a Hodgkin Reed Sternberg cell, right? With a binucleolate kind of an appearance. CD30. Like I said, CD30 is a marker which is strongly expressed in a membrane as well as in the Golgi zone positivity in the case of Hodgkin lymphoma, right? But even in this case of anaplastic large cell lymphoma, you have a strong positivity in the same kind of a fashion 
as you see in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. In fact, there's a standing dictum that if you have a very diffuse, strong expression of CD30 in your atypical tumor cell population, anaplastic large cell lymphoma is an important suspect because even those cases of anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which are negative for ALK, will express the diffuse, strong CD30 membrane and Golgi zone positivity. In this particular case, we were lucky because uh, ALK ISC showed a granular cytoplasmic positivity. So this looks like one of those variant ALK translocations, which is associated with a strong cytoplasmic rather than a combined cytoplasmic as well as nuclear positivity for ALK. CD20 again shows a smattering of the background small B lymphoid cells, which are present throughout this tumor. Now, this particular case is again a journal article, which, which, uh, which showcases the same DD, DD issue of a nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma of the syncytial variant, that is anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, check out for this kind of cells when you see such an undifferentiated tumor. These cells are known as the hallmark cells, which look a little bit like a horseshoe or a reniform kind of a configuration. So if you see this kind of atypical cells within the settings of Hodgkin, reed sternberg like cells, ALCL might be a possibility. And also the subcapsular sinus invasion that you see is in this particular case would be something that will be seen in the case of anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Observe in this case, a very strong membrane and Golgi zone positivity for CD30, but these cases will be negative for CD15. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. ALK is strongly expressed. CD4 shows focal positivity in a few of these cells. Look at the degree of expression of the other mature T cell markers. So we are, uh, we are doing this, this IHC in a set. You're doing CD3, CD7, and CD5. All these three are mature T cell markers. You see that CD3 and CD7 highlights, does not highlight these atypical lymphoid cells. However, the mature T cell marker CD5 strongly highlights most of these atypical large cells. So in order to identify the T cell lineage of these anaplastic large cell lymphoma, the moral of the story is you might have to do multiple mature T cell antigens. This is another case of anaplastic large cell lymphoma highlighting the sheet-like architecture of cells, some of which will look like classic hodgkin reed sternberg cells, but you also have these embryoid hallmark cells which are present along with them. Very strong diffuse membrane and Golgi zone positivity of CD30, but negative for CD15. Strong diffuse expression of ALK. Now, this is what we call an ALK positive, ALK rearrangement positive ALCL, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. But then there is this category called ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma. We shall be covering that in a single slide subsequently. So you see in this particular case, again, another case of anaplastic large cell lymphoma showcasing cells which look like hodgkin reed sternberg cells, subcapsular sinus invasion, which is again picked up with ALK in this particular case. And ALK here, ALK can show two types of positivity. The positivity can be in the cytoplasm along with the nucleus, or it can be in the cytoplasm alone, depending upon what type of translocation this particular tumor shows. Now, this is a case of ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma. The morphology stays the same. The CD30 strong expression pattern also stays the same. Only the ALK IHC is negative in these cases. Uh, and however, like just like in ALK positive ALCL, mature T cell markers will be aberrantly dropped. Sometimes focal expression of CD4 will be seen. CD8 is negative, and so are the CD8 associated uh, the CD8 associated, uh, I mean, kind of cytotoxic factors like TIA1, etc. T cell receptor is positive in these particular cases, and the post germinal marker MUM1 is positive because these cases are associated with rearrangement of IRF4 DUSP locus. Now, this is a nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, which morphologically looks like anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So, you have these sheets of cells, pretty uh, large numbers of which look a few of which look like hallmark cells. A few of these look like bizarre reed sternberg cells. But when you do IHC, you see that the cells are expressing CD30, but not in as strong a fashion as you saw in the case of ALCL. These cells are expressing CD15 strongly, which would be unusual in a case of ALCL. They are weakly expressing the PAX5. Uh, CD45 seems to be negative in majority of these large cell population. The cells which are being highlighted by CD45 are actually the background small to medium sized mixed lymphoid cells. CD20 is also, also negative. So you have a CD45 uh, negative, CD, CD20 negative immunoprofile. Keep in mind that anaplastic large cell lymphoma can be sometimes negative for CD45. Uh, the other mature uh, B cell marker CD79A is also negative, just as is expected in the case of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. 
This is another case of a sensational variant of nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, again showing the sheet-like effacement of the architecture, your atypical Hodgkin-like cells, which show a weak nuclear positivity of Pax5, just like a classic Hodgkin lymphoma cell, strong positivity for CD30, as well as CD15, and positivity for Epstein-Barr virus-associated encoded RNA on in-situ hybridization. Now, the fourth differential diagnosis of a nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma of syncytial variant is Epstein-Barr virus-positive diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Again, if this is the same kind of histotype, right? You got a diffuse sheet-like investment by sheets of atypical large lymphoid cells, some of which look like lacunar cells. Okay, so you have cells which look, which have got the very prominent nucleolus like those of Hodgkin cells. And you have got uh, some multinuclear cells, some binuclear cells, some of them looking like like completely like atypical reed sternberg cells, right? Say, for example, here you have got a binuclear cell which looks like a Hodgkin reed, uh, like a Hodgkin reed sternberg cells, right? So, of course, then the EBV associated DLBCL is thus a strong histological mimic of a nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma of the syncytial variant. And but the IHC should help you a lot, right? Because these cells are DLBCL, so they will express a strong positivity for most of the mature B cell markers like CD20, CD19, CD79, A, OC2, Bob1, etc. These are also strongly positive for CD30 and express the CD30 in the same fashion as you see in the case of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So keep that fact in mind. Uh, CD30 is a uh, important. IHC marker in the setting of classic Hodgkin lymphoma, but it is also a marker which is actually expressed in many of the histological mimics of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So that's important. However, CD15 will be negative. Had it been a classic Hodgkin lymphoma, CD15 would have been expected to be positive as well. OC2 shows a relatively strong nuclear positivity, just like a mature B cell. The post-germinal marker IRF4 MOM1 seems to be positive in some of these cases. And because these cases are associated with EBV infection, if you do an in-situ hybridization for EBV-associated RNA, you see that there's a strong nuclear positivity. So this, this article shows you the, the, the same kind of a scenario. You have a case of EBV-associated diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with cells which morphologically mimic the hodgkin reed sternberg cells but you get a positivity you get a strong positivity with b cell markers like cd20 and bob1 and oc2 which is not expected in the case of a classic hodgkin lymphoma of the of the nodular sclerosis subtype cd30 is strongly expressed like i said these cases will express cd30 but cd15 will not be expressed and because these are ebv associated in situ hybridization will show a strong nuclear positivity for ebv rna the last category of classic Hodgkin lymphoma is a category which is really very uncommon. In fact, uh, the only the only group of patients in whom this particular variant, I mean, this particular subtype of classic Hodgkin lymphoma might be seen will be the immunodeficient patients, especially those who are, say, having HIV. So uh, this account in the West, it accounts for less than 1% of the cases of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. And many of the cases are actually cases of, say, uh, ALK-negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which might have been misdiagnosed as a classic Hodgkin lymphoma lymphocyte depleted subtype. So in this particular case, you are obviously dealing with a very high-grade tumor, as is seen by the fact that towards the left, you have a complete necrosis of the tumor, and you have these karyorectic cells, which are basically cellular debris, which are lying within, the, within this area. And in these areas, you see sheet-like infiltrate of neutrophils as well, which cannot be seen in this in this, uh, in this magnification, we shall see it at a higher power. There seems to be a bit of a fibrous, uh, I mean, fibrous proliferation in the background. And there are sheet-like areas where the architecture is effaced by this diffuse population of highly atypical bizarre pleomorphic cells in the background. So you see this very atypical bizarre cells, which look like Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells. And you also have this neutrophils which have come into the zones of necrosis, right? So these are the areas which are necrosed, which are basically infiltrated by sheets of neutrophils. You have got this very large, atypical Hodgkin reed sternberg like very pleomorphic cells in sheets. So this is what is the reticular variant of the, uh, of the lymphocyte depleted subtype of classic Hodgkin lymphoma. So you have cells which look like Hodgkin reed sternberg cells, but very, very pleomorphic. Right, so you have this classic Hodgkin reed Sternberg cell, like cell. Uh, a few, a few eosinophils are thrown into the mix, but eosinophils are usually not a significant part of the picture in this particular variant. Uh, so you have the sheets of atypical Hodgkin reed Sternberg like cells, 
Also observe the mix of the neutrophils and the karyorectic debris in the background. So you have cells which look like the classic hodgkin reed sternberg cells. CD20 shows you a negativity as is expected in these cases. The, the, uh, the, the MUM1 shows a strong nuclear positivity in these cases. Uh, CD30 shows you a strong expression in the membrane as well as in the Golgi zone and so does CD15. CD15 also shows you a strong positivity in the membrane and in the Golgi zone. CD3 just highlights the background population, the scanned background population of small lymphoid cells. Keep in mind that in this subtype, usually the background population of small lymphoid cells is scanned. Okay, ALK1, why did we do ALK1? Because of course, with such a highly anaplastic morphology, an anaplastic large cell lymphoma definitely needs to be excluded. So ALK1 is negative in these cases. However, that does not exclude the possibility of it being a uh, of it being an ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma. But of course, ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphoma would not express the CD15 like we saw in this case. So as I said, the IRF4 is a marker which is strongly expressed in these cells, just like we expect in the case of a classic Hodgkin lymphoma cell. But uh, the uh, one strange finding in this particular case has been the negativity for EBV LMP1 because these cases are usually strongly associated with Epstein-Barr virus infection. So there's a little bit of an outlier. Now this, this case in this journal article again highlights a case of uh, 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 a lymphocyte depleted classical Hodgkin lymphoma in the spleen. Observe that there are sheets of these atypical lymphoid cells, few of which look like Hodgkin reed Sternberg cells. On doing ISC for CD15 and CD30, we see strong positivity in the membrane and in the Golgi zone. PAX5 shows a weak positivity compared to the strong positivity in the background B cell population. And on doing an and on doing a chromogenic in situ hybridization for Epstein-Barr virus associated RNA, we see that there is a positivity for EBER, thus uh, establishing the diagnosis of a lymphocyte depleted classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So that's all in this particular discussion. This has been a huge discussion. Uh, NLPHL is relatively an easy easy, uh, I mean, type of Hodgkin lymphoma because you don't have too many differentials. Although at the two ends, you have lymphocyte-rich classical Hodgkin lymphoma and a T-cell histiocyte-rich B-cell lymphoma. However, this classic Hodgkin lymphoma is a different ball game altogether. Depending upon the type of Hodgkin lymphoma that you are faced with, you will have lots of differential diagnosis and uh, the nodular sclerosis subtypes, syncytial variant, and the lymphocyte-rich subtypes are the one which will cause you the maximum differential diagnostic issue. So with this, with this takeaway, uh, with these takeaway messages, I end my discussion over here. Goodbye.